I'm Lisa Kral, Professor of Economics at SUNY Cortland, and I'm really glad to be here to give the talk. As Sam said, I visited the Gund Institute uh, late last winter, right before everything kind of uh, fell apart. And I had hoped that I would be able to present in person, but obviously uh, that uh, hasn't come to pass. So um, we're doing this instead. So I have kind of a uh, involved talk that I wanna give here, and I'm gonna move through it very quickly because I have a lot of information uh, to cover. So let me just get started. Um, it's pretty clear to anyone who's not in denial uh, that the economy, global capitalism, is uh, at war with the earth and that we're bearing witness to the apogee of that war with the sixth mass extinction and climate change. Uh, we stand at a great divide, I think, where we are in danger of losing our foothold on this abundant earth, to borrow phraseology from Eileen Christ's book. Our challenge is to avoid um, uh, slipping down the other side of that divide. So the challenge of the historical moment is to try to understand how we move. A world population of 8 billion people, economically interdependent, many in poverty, all involved in an economic system with a clear imperative to expand and a tendency to stagnate to some real rapprochement with Earth. Uh, can humans take their place as one of many species on Earth? Do humans have any power to change the trajectory of the present economic system? These are the questions that keep me up at night. And all of my scholarly work now is done with the central focus on the complexity of the formation of economic systems and how they define the relationship of humans to uh, other humans, but more importantly for our purpose, how they define the relationship of humans to the more than human uh, world. Okay, so I'm gonna start here by giving you a description of two stylized economic systems. On the right, we have hunters and gatherers, most of which are gone by now. Um, but for which we spent most of our history uh, as humans, as hunters and gatherers. And on the left here, we have a picture of a global assembly, an assembly line production, which is typical of global capitalism uh, or even state capitalism. Okay, so begin with hunters and gatherers. Uh, they were homo sapiens that lived as minimalists. Uh, surplus did not exist. Feedback loops prevented expansion. If you think about the imperative of mobility, it really prevented much expansion. And in material life, humans were mostly independent and self-reliant. Uh, most could quite literally fend for themselves. And each human had expansive knowledge of the more than human world. Um, they were observant and scientific, and they used that knowledge uh, to garner their material necessities. Humans organized in this economic system, I would say, were embedded in the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world. They lived as one of many. Um, uh, the economic system was not at war with the earth and it did not set up a duality between humans and earth. That didn't mean that hunters and gatherers didn't ever run into ecological problems, but the structure of their economic system didn't predispose them to such an outcome. Um, Homo sapiens, as I said, occupied this type of economic system for 200 to 300,000 years of our history, okay, as human beings. In fact, we came to be fully human in this kind of system. Compare this to system on the left, which I call system two. Um, global capitalism, where humans are not minimalists, in their productive life, they are existentially interdependent. Think about assembly line work, global supply chains, and global markets. They are involved in a system dynamic that is expansionary, where surplus takes the form of profit and feeds an endless expansion, an endless cycle of capital accumulation. And there exists in this system a duality between the human economic system 
and the more than human world where the economy quite literally functions as if, as if it is a supra material system. And by that term, I mean a system removed from the earth. So these two diametrically different systems are occupied by the same species. And so we come to understand through the simple exercise of juxtaposing them that the expression of the human relationship uh, to other humans and to the more than human world is profoundly contextual. And that context takes form in an economic system. Now we appear to be stuck in system two at a time when most of the characteristics of system one are what we aspire to. How do we move a uh, system two to a system that embeds humans in the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world where humans live as minimalists. They are not expansionary and they, um, and they are structured in their productive material lives to take their place as one of many species on the earth. Can we do that? I think we move to a clearer understanding of the magnitude of this challenge uh, by looking back, by looking at how we got uh, to this point. Um, so how do we draw the line of demarcation? Now I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make the claim that global capitalism is the legacy of the agricultural uh, revolution. In taxonomical language, they are part of the same family of systems. Capitalism changes the form of surplus and expansion, but not the fact of their existence. It altered human to human relationships but it did not change the fact of enhanced material interdependence, nor the presence of hierarchy. And finally, capitalism drove the wedge of duality between humans and the more than human world ever deeper, but it didn't create that duality. Surplus and expansion, hierarchy, profound material interdependence, and a duality between humans and earth embodied in the economic system all began with grain agriculture. In this sense, capitalism is what I refer to as a system within a system. So there was a profound change uh, that occurred long before capitalism and the industrial revolution. Uh, the line of demarcation of change is drawn between prehistory history, not between agriculture and industrial capitalism. Uh, from the perspective of expansion, altered human to human relationships, and most importantly, an altered relationship between humans and earth. The latter appears a continuum and the former a break. So this is a break. This is a continuum. This is a rendition on the left of uh, early Egyptian urbanization with early agriculture, okay? This is a continuum. This is a break. The line, this line of demarcation orients our inquiry more carefully around the etiology of economic systems and the power of those systems to fundamentally change the relationship of humans to earth. In the end, I think it teaches us a measure of humility in the face of the challenge that we now face. It helps us to move away from our commonly accepted narrative. Humans are smart, innovative, and cooperative, and we can work together to orchestrate our way out of this mess. That's our common narrative. Instead, we might say, holy hell, how did we evolve into an economic superorganism, and why is it we can't get a handle on this? One thing we know for sure, is that we've not been able to change uh, the structure and dynamic of the economic system, uh, the agricultural system, the system begun with agriculture for 10,000 years. We've not been able to change the trajectory of the economic superorganism. Instead, our inventiveness, our capacity for culture and cooperation seem to have enhanced the structure and dynamic began with agriculture, not worked against it. It lands us at the, ap the apogee of system two. And again, let me reiterate, almost 8 billion people, many living in poverty, a highly interdependent global economic system 
that oscillates between growth and stagnation, a global economic system breaching planetary boundaries, and a profound dialectical tension where we're required to grow on the one hand to provide jobs and eliminate poverty and not grow on the other hand uh, because we're breaching ecological limits. And we appear to have an inability uh, to change course. Now, I don't wanna spend all the time I have talking to you about the human transition to agriculture um, or what I would relate, uh, relabel the uh, formation of the economic superorganism. Uh, to do it justice would take a lot more time than I have here, but a few words need to be said so that you can appreciate the processes that formed it and what a wholly different system it was. Agriculture was a dramatic reconfiguration of the human species, and I should say here that I did some foundational work on this with John Gowdy. We wrote uh, uh, four uh, major papers together on the topic. There is a quote I like to uh, 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 give by Albert Einstein, and it says, we should make things as simple as possible, but not simpler, okay? And so we're gonna wade into the weeds for just a minute. The first thing we notice with a more compl complete uh, exploration of the agricultural revolution is this. Agriculture is a universal system. It crosses species boundaries. It's not the exclusive domain of humans. And all species that practice agriculture end up with a structure and dynamic to, the econ to their economic systems that is pretty much the same. All species are expansionary. They all employ extensive divisions of labor where they are highly interdependent around the focal point of cultivation, which is essentially energy production. They are all involved in a powerful feedback loop then between division of labor, cultivation, population growth. They all form a formidable whole in material life, turning them into economic superorganisms. Now, insect agriculturalists are also biological superorganisms, humans are not. The feedback loops between division of labor, population growth, and cultivation, grain production for humans, are indeed powerful and astounding. So there's an energetic aspect to agriculture that is universal. And both the species that cultivate, uh, that are cultivated, annual grains in the case of humans, and the species that cultivate, humans, are altered in the process. There is coevolution then that is taking place and processes of group and multi-level selection that are all part of the complex matrix of evolution around the formation of agriculture. One could in fact easily claim that the human propensity for cooperation and culture were co-opted by the formation of the agricultural system. Humans had developed an elaborate capacity for cooperation and culture long before agriculture. But this capacity and its embodiment in economic life became something altogether different with grain agriculture. Cooperation formed an almost mechanistic interdependence around the focal point of energy production, creating an integrated, almost machine-like quality to human life. For insects, the process was much slower and worked through uh, mutation and a selection that occurred over millions of years, but in the end, the results are the same. Now, the acknowledgement of the universal uh, teaches us something important about the power of systems and the play of evolution in their creation. And it certainly leaves us to ponder whether humans are exceptional. The powerful vortex of energy production and cohesion cemented through a division of labor and population growth subsumed the human species and made them economic superorganisms. And once this system got going, um, it was very difficult to disengage from it. It's clear that processes of evolution are at work in the formation of economic systems, but perhaps what is less clear is exactly how those fifth systems fit in the matrix of evolution. Did we become a different whole with agriculture? Does the agricultural system, an economic system, 
have unique standing in the matrix of evolution? I think these are as yet unresolved questions for evolution. Regardless of where the superorganism, the economic superorganism stands in the matrix of evolution, it stands as its own cohesive whole as an economic system. I call it self-referential and solipsistic in that its powerful feedback loops create a self-reinforcing system. So it is a self-reinforcing system of energy production, increasing interdependency through elaboration of division of labor and population growth. In this way, the system becomes removed from the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world in any but a very superficial way. In agriculture, obviously, there is attention to a time to plant and a time to harvest. But it is a system that literally creates an us and them tension between humans and the more than human world. As my philosopher friend, Bill Vitek says, ancient and indigenous understandings of wild, creative and sacred earth were interrupted, driven underground and nearly eliminated with grain agriculture. Now the particular human story is constructed by creating a tapestry of the universal and the particular, increasing, integrating the complexity of evolutionary processes, culture and ingenuity, chance circumstances, and the power of universal systems into whole cloth. Humans became a self-referential and profoundly interde interdependent species of expansion and surplus with agriculture, just as their insect counterparts had, but they did so with their own imprint and their own history. Again, I don't wanna wade into uh, the weeds except in a very superficial way, way but a little bit of wading is uh, necessary. There was the chance circumstances of the Holocene warming. There was the store of available carbon in the soil and the natural fertility cycles of river deltas, all of which helped in the engagement of agriculture. And there was human ingenuity, which played some part in the dramatic coevolutionary dynamic between humans and the annual grains that they cultivated. Humans could select for seeds that didn't shatter, uh, uh, larger seed, si seed size, um, and then eventually expand agricultural production given their ability to irrigate. Um, there was also the bad ecology of annual grain, which fed into the cycle and the cycle of expansion, because one way to counteract the downside of the ecology of annual grains was to simply expand production, okay? And one of the most formidable of the uniquely human attributes of the system is the propensity for culture and institutional embellishment, um, not only to elaborate the division of labor quickly, but also to implement uh, institutions of hierarchy out of the surplus that arose, okay? Uh, taking its form with queens and kings and pharaohs and et cetera. And this of course feeds back into the system of, uh, of expansion. And equally important are the other institutional embellishments of surplus, which I call the economic institutions, markets, expanding trade networks, debt, money, taxes, property rights, for example. We can understand that the creation of markets and the expansion of trade was directly associated with the production of agricultural surplus. And institutional embellishments do take on a life of their own, as seen by the movement of markets from a place to distribute surplus to a place where money is made in trade to capitalism, where the prospect of making money feeds back onto production and the garnering of surplus at the point of production, which we call surplus value, which is then translated into profit, which is translated into further expansion of markets. Let me reiterate, grain agriculture starts humans down the path of an economic superorganism. And we've been on that path ever since. Eventually we end with global capitalism. 
And I repeat, capitalism changes the form of surplus and expansion, but not the fact of their existence. It altered human to human relationships, but it did not change the fact of enhanced material interdependence and the presence of hierarchy. And finally, capitalism drove the wedge of duality between humans and the more than human world ever deeper, but it did not cre create that duality. Capitalism is an economic super art organism par excellence. The duality between humans and earth that was created through the agricultural system came to its apogee with capitalism, which is a system that takes surplus, where surplus takes the form of profit and it's endless dynamic and where the interdependence between humans is navigated through the ubiquitous existence of markets and elaborate productive interdependencies. And of course, once this system was fertilized with the industrial revolution, the duality between humans and earth already embodied in the economic system takes a most pernicious form. An expansionary, expansionary and self-referential system is freed from energy constraints. And the crises embodied in the institutional structure become ever more formidable as the system matures uh, with fossil fuel. Now, this is what I want to emphasize. The duality between humans and Earth is embodied in the interdependencies and feedback loops and the way the system, the economic system functions as if it is not earthly. The duality is real. It is not just some oversight in economic thought. And again, it didn't start with the industrial revolution, but it did take a more pernicious form with both capitalism and then capitalism married to the industrial revolution. The challenge of duality has come to rest uh, in the dialectical tension of the historical moment, the need for growth and waste for job creation and to fight poverty and avoid stagnation on the one hand and the need for limits because we are crossing planetary boundaries on the other. This is a dialectical tension with no easy solution, no matter how hard we try to hedge it and we do try to hedge it. So I wanna be clear about what I am claiming. I understand full well that the economic system is always material. Coal is mined, iron ore is extracted and smelted, crops are grown in soil, animals are raised and eaten, forests are cut, rare earth metals are mined, externalities of our combustion of fossil fuel build in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But capitalism functions as a supramaterial system. Think of some of the common economic variables used by economists in standard introductory macroeconomics, wages, profit, rent, income, spending, investment, savings, inflation, and GDP. The economy is presented as a circular flow of income and spending. And if not all the income that's spent in the production of goods and not all the income generated in the production of goods and services is spent, the system contracts. In this particular rendition, contraction is not caused because of biophysical limits, um, but because not all income is spent. So I would conclude that the economic system embodies a paradox. It is two things at once. It does function as a circular flow of income and spending and all of its internal problems of crisis, which are independent of its material dimensions. And of course, the material dimensions of the economy are also real. We all know that the earthly connection to the economic system only orbited the outer reaches of the economic ideas of the great economic thinkers. It was never the focus of their economic thinking. If I had time, I could take you through the ideas of Smith and Ricardo, even Malthus, Marx and Engels, the neoclassical bunch, uh, Beblin and Keynes and Baron and Sweezy to prove my point. But let me just say clearly, their economic analysis orbited the supramaterial uh, uh, realm. This is true from conservative to radical economic thinkers, and for good reason. 
the economic system had come to embody, embody an exaggerated duality and economic thinking reflected that. So over the past 250 years, the ideas and preoccupations of the worldly philosophers to use uh, a title given by Robert Heilbronner in the book he wrote about them, um, those ideas and preoccupations have centered on the supermaterial realm and relegated the connection of the economy to the earth to the margins of their analysis. I vote to relabel them the unearthly philosophers. And of course, the irony is that a social science constructed to understand the material organization of human society mostly lost sight of the centrality of the earthly roots of the economy. Again, why? Because the economic system embodied a profound duality between humans and earth that had been in the making for 10,000 years and came to an apogee with global capitalism. To miss this point, to miss this is to miss perhaps the most important fact of the economic system and the trajectory at work for the past 10,000 years. Enter what I label the earthly philosophers, that group of economic thinkers interested in understanding the war between the economy and earth. It is important to reconnect the economy to the earth. There's no question about it. But in that endeavor, it is paramount to understand the duality that exists between the economic system and earth. And in, a, in, in other words, one has to deal with the paradox. The economic system is both material and supramaterial. So when the earthly philosophers criticize the economists of the past who have overlooked that fact, the fact that the economy is connected to the earth, um, and they make every effort to show all the ways the economy is connected to the earth, they are in a sense missing perhaps the most important reality of the historical moment, the paradox of the economic system. The unearthly philosophers were trying to get a handle on one dimension of a powerful economic system, a thing unto itself, a circular flow of income and spending, a process of capital accumulation, exploitation and crisis, an invisible hand channeling self-interest to social welfare, pick your story. The earthly philosophers are trying to get a handle on its earthly dimensions, yet the challenge is to understand both. This is the essence of the paradox we confront, a paradox again that is embodied in the dialectical tension of the moment. Now I wanna end here with a few uh, words about methodology. All of what I have presented here is based on a methodology of historical uh, and dialectical materialism. If you just Google historical materialism, you come up with a definition. It's a materialist conception of history that quote, focuses on human societies and their development through history, arguing that history is the result of material conditions rather than ideals. In simplistic terms, it is the economic structure and dynamic of society that determines its history. And it is this that contextualizes what we're interested in here, the relationship of humans to the earth. We must focus on economic systems and how they change over time as a central component of understanding human society, and in particular, the human relationship to earth. This is clearly not a finished project, especially when it comes to understanding the movement from system one to system two and the paradox of system two. It is a complexity as we have seen that demands interdisciplinary work weaving whole cloth out of evolutionary biology, anthropology, economics, systems analysis. The most famous of the economic historiographers were of course Marx and Engels, and they lacked an expansive understanding of human prehistory, evolution, and the laws of physics, although they dabbled in all of those things. Having said that, they clearly understood that taken back to its most fundamental level, historical materialism 
was about the evolution of humans out of a dialectical interaction with the earth. Unfortunately, the rich methodology offered by Marx and Engels was rejected by some of the earthly philosophers out of claims that Marx had missed the connection of the earth to the economy, that he had, for example, no appreciation for the irreversibilities of economic processes. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds of that debate. Um, as I have already pointed out, Marx was in the main one of the unearthly philosophers. He was dealing with the super material side of the system, and he was caught up in that. I don't think there's any question about it. Marx, Marx saw capitalism in self-referential terms, where its structure and dynamic intentions were determined by variables internal to the system. And his analysis ultimately led him to conclude uh, that the system would sow the seeds of its own destruction, and the dialectical tension would make itself visible through the class tensions that would eventually lead to revolution, okay? A second reason that ecological economics rejected any wisdom of Marx and by extension, his historical and dialectical methodology uh, was that E.E. E. equated Marx with his, with his, and his ideas with the revolutions that were undertaken in his name. Now, I'm not here to defend the revolutions undertaken in Marx's name, let me be very clear. But honestly, rejecting Marx for this reason is a bit like rejecting Darwin for the eugenics movement, okay? I am here to defend historical and dialectical materialism as a methodology because I believe it is indispensable in understanding how we arrive at this historical moment, at this paradox. It focuses on context and specifically the context that defines the relationships between humans and the more than human world, the economic context. History done well is the key to etiology. In this case, the etiology of the duality between humans and earth embodied in our economic system. It is the key to exploring the paradox of our economic order. How we navigate that paradox will, de be, will determine ultimately whether we in fact slide down the other side of the great divide. Ecological economics was prescient in calling on the question of growth. It's a very revolutionary proposition to say that we need to question growth in the context of this economic system. But what we really need to understand to breathe life into the challenge of growth is to understand that we are contextual and to understand the context that defines our relationship with the more than human world we are required to understand economic systems and their formation and movement over time and space, and especially the rise of the economic superorganism. This is something more than a simple materialism that says the economy is a subset of Earth and therefore cannot grow indefinitely. So I'm going to stop there and um, hope there are a few questions. And I'll let Sam take it from here. Thanks so much, Lucy. That was fascinating. And I want to remind all the attendees here to use the Q&A box um, to submit your questions here on Zoom. And um, then I will read those questions to, to Lucy and she'll respond. Oh, cool. Questions are already coming in. So question from Josh Sterlin, um, hi Lisi, I've really enjoyed your work. Very much looking forward to your upcoming book. You underline the idea that grain agriculture and it's almost mechanically necessary resultant civilizations is the beginning of our present era. Josh says he's called it the civilizine. So that rather than capitalism, the industrial revolution and so on, which are merely latter economic development. So Josh's question is, how might this idea be complicated by the new archaeological data summarized by people like James Scott, David Graeber, and David Wengrow that seem to show that early cities weren't necessarily coinciding with the development of agriculture and that they may have been rather egalitarian? Well, 
Uh, this is the way that I would answer that question, and I'll refer to the work of James Scott, okay? Um, James, so I think of agriculture in the context of production, okay? Uh, and I realize James Scott dealt with the development of city-states and that sort of thing. But he also, in his book, Against the Grain, deals with the issue of uh, agriculture um, and, the, and, the, and the mechanistic kind of nature of agriculture, the simplifying nature, the almost, uh, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it lends itself, if you will, to a, uh, 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 a kind of production process which can employ a division of labor easily. And is a, and in fact, what they, uh, James Scott refers to it as is a de-skilling process, okay? So I think if we concentrate on production, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, production itself of grain agriculture engages this kind of mechanistic interdependent system, which is what I want to emphasize. That becomes a, a thing unto itself that is then somewhat removed, functions internal to itself and is somewhat removed from the uh, 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 more than human world. Um, and I think over time it builds on itself and you do eventually get the development of, you eventually get the development of urban uh, civilization and the rise of uh, city states. Um, it's institutional elaborations of uh, uh, the system um, that uh, take it somewhat in that direction and also just kind of the mechanistic dynamic of the system uh, producing surplus and expanding and creating more complexity and building on itself over time. It may be the difference uh, in our analyses is in part, uh, I am taking a very broad stroke, okay? Uh, James Scott, for example, is involved in a more detailed analysis of a more narrow period of time. So that's my best answer to that. But James Scott actually has an interesting, a very interesting uh, chapter on the de-skilling process of uh, grain agriculture, uh, which I think is absolutely fascinating when you think of uh, the agricultural revolution as production and how production is organized. Thanks, Lucy. Um, one another question from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for this presentation. How do you account for differences among human experiences and avoid the problem of universalizing? It seems the way forward must start by recognizing and supporting diverse modes of living, as even Marx recognized. Um, that's a difficult uh, question uh, to answer. I, I do think that we can learn a lot from the diverse modes of, of living. And again, I think this is a, a problem with the kind of historical approach that I take because I say it's historical on the one hand, but I am painting a very broad stroke of history, okay? And losing a lot of details along the way, okay? But what I see at the end of the day is a profound similarity in the ways that I have described expansion, uh, interdependence, duality. I see a profound connection between what happened with agriculture and the present. So I am taking a very broad stroke of history. I don't think that necessarily means that there might not be exceptions to that, uh, that we can gain insight from. And I certainly think that in the process of trying to uh, figure out how we go forward, there are all kinds of really interesting experiments um, 
and 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 ways of approaching um, how you create revolutionary change in the context of this larger system. And those, I don't know what the seeds of those uh, uh, revolutionary, little teeny revolutionary movements uh, will ultimately uh, 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 deter what ultimately will come of them. I can't say that. I can use the example of work being done at the Land Institute. It's an organization that I'm very familiar with, um, you know, where the philosophy uh, of uh, 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 changing agriculture um, started out, and I and and I, I won't hold West responsible for what I say, but I think I'm right in 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 saying uh, somewhat what his philosophy was was to look at those prairie ecosystems and say, how do we model agriculture looking at the wisdom of those prairie ecosystems? That created the seeds of a different kind of agriculture and a different approach to agriculture, what the end result of that will be, um, and the development of perennial grains and perennial polyculture, what the end result of all of that will be, I don't know, okay? So, um, but I certainly think that there are exceptions and seeds of resistance uh, in many places that are worth paying attention to. So I don't know if that answered the question or not, but. Thanks, Lucy. Um, keep the questions coming into the Q&A, everyone. I'm gonna jump in with one of my own um, that, hopefully follows on that a little bit. Um, you know, we as, as ecological economists are frustrated and annoyed sometimes when critics seem to purposefully misinterpret in sort of fear-mongering ways ideas like degrowth that come from ecological economics and say they want us to go back to hunting and gathering lifestyles or something like that. And um, but I'm, when folks like you, like like James Scott and and your your work with John Gowdy in particular, make such a strong and convincing argument that a lot of the the tendencies that have escalated to become the ecological crises we face today have, like a, a lot of those seeds were planted literally when when cultivation began of of grains and when the first states were created, you know, sort of coincided. When that's the analysis, you know, I'm going to ask you a question that I, you know, I'm kind of annoyed at when people ask me about my research, but what do, what do we do? What's the, what's the way forward? Like, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe I have to buy your book, but I think that. Well, the book's not out yet. Okay. So. <laughs> when it is. You can't buy it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, assuming you're not proposing to, to do away with, with agriculture and-, and Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I think, no, I'm not proposing to do away with agriculture. No, no, that's not what I'm proposing at all. And I'm certainly not proposing that we take 8 billion people back to hunting and gathering because um, that would be the stupidest idea anybody could come up with, okay? I mean, that's not only is it just uh, biophysically impossible, uh, but we don't move uh, in that direction, okay? So I guess um, what I would say is this. I think a measure, I think a measure of humility is important in what we confront, okay? And so part of what I do is to interject that measure of humility. And what I think we need to be humble about is the power of the economic system that we're involved in, okay? Um, and because then we start thinking, um, a little bit differently about 
what causes economic systems to form and how much power we have. And I think we start thinking more critically um, about uh, where the levers of change are and where the levers of change aren't in that exercise. Okay, so I think, you know, part of what I do is just to get people to think a little bit more critically and a little bit more le with a little bit less hubris about um, the power of humans to do anything we want. Okay, and to recognize that we are indeed caught in the most profound paradox. Um, you know, if you want to go back to Marx, I mean, the dialectical tension that Marx identified is the tension, class tensions that build. Now, I'm not going to deny that class tensions aren't real. Okay. But we could take his methodology and say that the dialectical tension of the moment is this profound problem we have where we are literally trying to grow to create jobs and eliminate poverty on the one hand, and on the other hand, to not grow, to stay within limits uh, or to not cross over planetary boundaries, which we're not doing a very good job of. Now that seems to me to be a dialectical tension that will eventually resolve itself. But my concern is that it resolves itself and it puts us on the other side of the great divide, okay, by the time we get there. And so um, I don't, I don't have answers, but I would move, I would move into, uh, uh, you know, I'm not advocating an overthrow of capitalism. Um, although capitalism probably needs to be, I mean, we probably need a different kind of economic system. But what we can do is work on our population issues. What we can do is we can engage in massive conservation efforts. What we can do is make sure that any growth in the economic system does in fact eliminate poverty. We can do some things like that. So it reorients us. And I always think that we want to keep one thing central. And this is what I've tried to do in my work. I think we need to keep the one th this one thing central, the duality between humans and the more than human world. That is the project we're working on. We're trying to re-embed humans in the rhythm and dynamic of this wonderful, magical universe. That's where we have to keep our focus. That's what we have to keep looking at. And that seems to diffuse into, um, you know, kind of a secondary concern. Our first concern is we should be concerned about the elimination of poverty. There is no question about that. But we have to maintain a central focus around the problem of a great divide that we're slipping down the other side of. So I don't know if that answers your question. It was sort of just a tangent there. Thanks, Lucy. Um, we have time for a couple more questions, and I'm going to read one from Robert Jensen, who, in addition to defending the appropriateness of universalizing about some aspects of <laughs> human experience, um, asks, is it fair to say that it is possible for cities to develop without agriculture, but it's not likely, and that the widespread development of cities comes with agriculture? OK, say that again. So Robert's asking, if it's fair to say that cities could develop without agriculture, but that it's not likely to happen on a, in a widespread way and without agriculture and asking if- I don't think it's possible for cities uh, of, any, of any magnitude to develop without agriculture. I don't. I, I, 
I, I don't think it is. Um, but Robert Jensen might know more about that than me. <laughs> no, I don't think it's possible. I don't think you would have gotten the development of cities not like we have without the widespread uh, uh, practice of grain agriculture. No. I mean, maybe you would have gotten some kind of urbanization, but it would be very minor and modest. All right, so another question from an anonymous attendee. How do the many historical cases of people's abandoning agriculture fit into the model? Um, is it just the result of socio-ecological collapses? Is it merely a temporary period before they're recaptured, so to speak, by agricultural civilization? Yes, I think there were many uh, uh, cases where they abandoned agriculture and they abandoned agriculture for ecological uh, reasons of ecological degradation. Um, but uh, eventually um, they are recaptured in a system which is the legacy of agriculture, um, which takes on a more elaborate institutional uh, uh, form. Um, but eventually they are recaptured. Um, by a system, but you do have, I mean, all, all the collapse of all kinds of agricultural systems. Um, um, history is littered with them. But eventually, as I say, the legacy of the agricultural system, which takes form in global capitalism, has in fact taken over the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone to put more questions in the chat. If there are, we got five minutes left um, because there's not any questions or not in the chat. Sorry, in the Q&A because um, there's not right now. I'll ask one more and you can respond by saying whatever you feel like talking about for five, five minutes. Um, so, you know, there's this debate that kind of involves stratigraphers, these ge geologists aging the or defining where the different epochs and ages are, um, and, and social scientists to an extent because it involves humans about when the Anthropocene started. And there's those who say, you know, after World War II when there's all these uh, nuclear elements in the, in the, going to be in the geologic record or, and plastics. And some say, you know, the beginning of industrial capitalism when coal, coal started being burned on a widespread scale. And then there's others who, similar to your argument, are arguing that, that there was sort of a soft Anthropocene that began with the beginning of agriculture and there's will be changes that are visible in the geologic record from, from that. Um, but I'm curious about that, that argument sort of comes from, a, or, Brings, brings to the fore a criticism of historical materialism that, I, that I've heard before about it being sort of deterministic. And, and the way you talk about how capitalism and, and other sort of the social events since the beginning of agriculture have unfolded um, could be called deterministic. And I wanna know how you respond to that critique. Um, I think it is somewhat deterministic. Okay, I think the recognition of the power of systems once they get going uh, to take on a life of their own, uh, I think there is a, a deterministic uh, um, uh, component to it. Um, and that has bothered me. That has bothered me profoundly. Okay, um, but as I say, there are dialectical tensions developing in the system that are going to have to resolve themselves. So we are going to end up uh, with something else, okay, eventually. Those, dial those kinds of dialectical tensions don't go on indefinitely. So I don't think, uh, I mean, I think there is from agriculture to capitalism a deterministic kind of flow. Okay, um, all of my work leads me uh, to, that con to that conclusion. Um, how the dialectical tension gets resolved, I don't know. 
I can't answer that question. I think um, I would also take that discussion away from, you know, how do we set, how do we see in the, you know, geological record that a different kind of system took hold then, and how does it, how does it, how is it recorded in our geological uh, 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 record? I think maybe it's more productive for us to think about how it is taking form in our evolutionary uh, dynamic, okay? Because if you think about the evolution of the economic superorganism, okay, it's a very different use of human capabilities, human intelligence. Um, you know, you think about the human co propensity for cooperation. I mean, it's one thing to have a human propensity for cooperation uh, where we help each other, we're empathetic and we develop culture. It's another thing entirely to have a human propensity for cooperation that ends up like this picture. You understand? and involved in global supply chains where we have little power to do anything. We're caught up in it. So I think maybe the way to think about it uh, is to, to ask ourselves the question, and this is anthropocentric, to ask ourselves the question, what are we becoming? Are, did we, are we becoming something different? as a result of engaging this different kind of system um, and maybe reflect a little bit more on that. Um, uh, your question about determinism is, a, is, a, is an interesting and important question and I can tell you that it is something that has uh, kept me up at night because I'm not a person who is particularly enamored with capitalism, to be quite honest with you, okay? And yet I found myself through this research that I've done, ending up concluding that once we started agriculture, there was kind of an inevitability to get to this point. That has bothered me. Um, and I don't, know exactly what to do with that, okay? Maybe some things are deterministic. Thank you, so it was fascinating and marvelous, including the defense of determinism scientifically, at least even when it makes us uncomfortable. Um, so it's one o'clock now, and on behalf of the Gunn Institute, I wanna thank Lisi and everyone who joined us online and asked great questions. Um, we're going to have the video and the podcast of today's talk available next week. And next Friday, please join us again for the next Gund Exchange with Rachel Oldinsky from UVM, who is going to talk about sustainable medical products. Her talk's called Plants Under Pressure. And th that'll be next Friday, same time, noon, on November 13th. So thank you and see you then. Okay, Sam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's good to see you. And I hope I get to talk to you in person at some point. Yeah.